In concluding our discussion of microevolution, we now come to the star of the show, natural selection. Natural selection refers to differential survival of different genotypes. We saw that with Geospitza, Darwin's finches, Galapagos, the drought. Some individuals were able to still get enough to eat because they could handle those bigger, heavier seeds during the drought and they're the ones that left behind the descendants. So the whole population changed. Their descendants then had larger beaks than the prior generation. Another classic example of natural selection over a very short time period involves the peppered moth, or Bitston betularia. And the peppered moth, the normal form looks like this, which is very hard to see against lichen on a tree trunk. But there's also a melanistic form here, which is very hard to see against a black, dirty background, okay? Now, this is going to give you an, an outline of what's called industrial melanism. During the 19th century in Britain, suddenly everybody wanted to burn coal, to burn the fuel for their, their industries, to warm their houses and everything else. And this churned out vast quantities of soot, okay? And the soot settled on the sides of buildings, on tree trunks. And what we found was what was called industrial melanism. So this is melanistic, or is the black form. And these thrive in polluted habitats. So this black moth was almost unknown until the Industrial Revolution. So you have smoke everywhere throughout industrial England, through the midsection here, Manchester, Liverpool, down to London. And in these areas where there was a lot of industry, the black form of the moth became almost the only form of the moth. There were still some of those nice pretty white ones with the black speckles, but these were out in areas like Cornwall that didn't have any industry, so the air was clean, the tree trunks were not polluted. These black forms are perfectly well hidden against a black background. And so the main source of mortality in these insects is bird predation. Birds are visual hunters. They just couldn't see the black insect. So the black ones are now at a huge selective advantage. The white forms stood out a mile against the dirty background, and they were eliminated by natural selection. Now this process of industrial melanism, where you see the coloration of an insect turning to match the background upon which it rests, has been observed in a hundred different species. So it's not just unique to the Biston betularia, but lots of different insects have shown the same trend to turn black in polluted environments. So the way it's reckoned is that this melanistic form was essentially just a rare, rare mutation, almost unknown in the 1850s, 1860s. But as the industrial age unfolded, during the 1860s and 1870s, there's more and more soot. And so the relative frequency of the allele that controlled for the coloration of this insect increased and went almost to fixation by the 1950s, okay? So this, is, this actually is theoretical uh, as best as can be reconstructed. It's believed that the allele that coded for the black coloration was a single dominant allele. You just have one copy and you'd be hidden and protected against your predators. So selection pressure was intense for that to become more common in the population. Now, what's been fascinating about this particular story has been that in the latter half of the 20th century, people began to care about their health from pollution in the air and the health of the environment. And so with the advent of strict air quality controls since the 1970s, emissions have cleaned up. So this is no longer black soot. This is just steam on a cold day, okay? So the trees, tree trunks are no longer being sort of colored black by the soot. Walls of buildings are no longer turning black. And so what happened through the 70s, 80s, and 90s is this melanistic form disappeared.
So by the end of the millennium, it was pretty much gone, back to the way it was originally. That white form with the black speckles now, once again, is the best camouflage against a background of the lichen. The black form was too conspicuous and would be eaten by pigeons and sparrows and whatever else eat these little moths. So, these examples, Darwin's finches, Biston betularia, emphasize the incredible importance of selection. And we now recognize that selection is the dominant form of evolutionary change in any population. We know this because of the facility with which organisms can change from artificial selection. Physical forms are very malleable or very plastic through time with selective breeding. We see natural selection, and I will show you examples later on in the course already. Climate change is not as bad yet as it's predicted to be in the coming century. But many organisms are already evolving in response to changes in our climate. We also see it in all of our hospitals and all of our agricultural fields as we try new antibiotics, as we try out new pesticides. These things work for a while, but they're actually forces of selection to get rid of genetic susceptibility to these powerful pesticides and antibiotics. And so now we're seeing resistant strains of bacteria, resistant strains of weeds to the poisons that we set out to try to control them. Let me give you a concrete example of this. We have here uh, what was going on with the early days of DDT in terms of trying to control insects. And this is the dosage of the DDT that would be administered on a field or on a crop. And then this is the percentage of insects exposed to that dosage that would die. Okay. Now, when they first tried DDT, it worked great because most insects had a, suscepti a susceptibility allele. And they were, in fact, homozygous for the susceptibility allele. And so the pesticide worked. Okay. And so you were able to get rid of 75, 80% of all the insects in a field your first application. But now you've gotten rid of that S allele as much as you could. There happens to be always within a population some other variant. It may be rare initially, but it is resistant either to a pesticide or an antibiotic. So in this particular case, there would have already been a few individual insects in the population that are carrying one copy of the resistance allele and it took almost 10 times as much pesticide to get the same effect. Okay, so what you're doing now is selecting out the rest of that susceptibility allele until what you've got left is just the capital R allele, the resistant allele. So after several generations, the only thing that's going to be left in the population are the resistance alleles. And now you have had to increase your dosage, this is on a logarithmic scale, a hundred times to still be able to control the insect. So if we look through time, here we have percentage mortality on a standard dose of DDT. In the first few months, it's great. You kill off most of the insects, 90%. But for that same dosage, after less than a year, you're now you're only killing off a half. And in less than a year and a half, now you're killing off only about a quarter of the insects. Those are resistance spreads because you've gotten rid of all those individuals that were susceptible. They're no longer contributing to the gene pool. The only survivors are resistant, and the resistance alleles becomes more common in the population. As the population becomes more resistant, your pesticide stops working. Now, there's a lot of fuss out there right now because of genetically modified organisms, and this is a new technique that plant breeders are attempting in order to get around some of these problems with resistance to pesticides. Now, there's a lot of concerns about GMOs, but what they're really all about is putting into a crop a gene that renders them resistant to a herbicide. Okay? If you make your soybeans resistant to a poison, you can then poison the fields and all the weeds in the field will now be taken out by your pesticide. And so that's Roundup. Roundup Ready 
means that the plants have now got in them a gene that resists the effect of glyphosates, which is the active herbicidal poison in Roundup. So the soybeans are fine. Okay? However, these Roundup ready GMOs occasionally hybridize with neighboring plants. So that gene, just like I showed you with some of the Geospitza genes hybridizing from Fortis to Scandens with that allele number 128 or whatever it was, this is already happening with the GMOs. So the genes from the soybeans are getting into weeds and that's spreading the herbicide resistance. And this is a classic case of gene flow. So you have canola that's been made Roundup ready. You could spray your fields with Roundup. It doesn't harm your canola. You can do the same thing with corn. You do it with soy. All great. But these things, very small occasional events, hybridize with some unwanted plants like pigweed. And pigweed gets into the field. It's been now obtaining the glyphosate resistance genes from these GMO crops. And once it's in the pigweed, that lucky individual that happened to be the hybrid and got that resistance allele, it's not being killed by the Roundup. And so already, it's only been 10 or 15 years that Roundup ready crops have been in, in, our, in our fields and already resistance has evolved in things like pigweed that new GMOs are being developed that will be immune to yet new poisons that can be spread on the weeds.